nice, bright, you know, funny guy. He was a character. And, you know, he just loved to smile and laugh and have fun. What happened to this teenage boy walking through this school gym? He's captured here on surveillance camera until... Come to Lowndes High School now. There's a dead, dead body out here. Kendrick Johnson was found upside down in a rolled gym mat. Investigators say he was reaching for a shoe, got stuck, and died. We have found nothing to indicate this was anything other than just a tragic accident. You could tell he was beaten. Or the tissue from the jaw, which was the diagnosis of blunt force trauma to the neck. The Kendrick Johnson case. I'm not going to discuss that with you. Why not, sir? Because our case is closed. What happened after his body arrived at the funeral home was anything but normal. The heart, lungs, liver, etc. were not with the body. The brain? The brain. They were all absent. The Georgia Bureau of Investigation, which did the first autopsy, says they put the organs back into Kendrick Johnson's body. The funeral home says the organs never came with the body. After months of protest and demands for answers, an announcement by the U.S. Department of Justice. My office to conduct a formal review of the facts and investigation surrounding the death of Kendrick Johnson. Deputy U.S. Marshals serving search warrants in connection with the mysterious death of Kendrick Johnson. The U.S. Marshals not tactical gear. Yes, sir. To the nth degree. I was laying in bed. I got a bang on my door. They were just like, it's about the Kendra Johnson case. The ongoing Kendra Johnson investigation. I broke down and cried. Viewers can look in your eyes. Did you have anything to do with the death of Kendrick Johnson? No, sir. Nor me or my family had anything to do with his death. Did you see Kendrick that day? No. I did not. There he is, in the white t-shirt and jeans, carrying a yellow folder. The Johnsons now have this video as the result of a lawsuit. We don't have any time code with which to synchronize the events that are shown in the video. There are also a number of files that are corrupted because they've not been processed correctly and they're not playable. There are four cameras in the gym that records motion from when the lights turn on in the morning until when the lights are turned off at night, except for the area of interest. I would absolutely expect there to be some record of that activity, and we don't have any here. And it's suspicious that that time period is not, not there. Eight years ago, Johnson's body was found rolled up in a gym mat at Lowndes County High School. Lowndes County Sheriff Ashley Polk announced officials were reopening the investigation. They had a recording saying who possibly committed a crime in the JJ situation. Hi, guys. Welcome to my YouTube channel. Today I want to talk about the Kendrick Johnson case. This case has recently been reopened and it's been controversial from the very beginning because although it was officially ruled an accident, a lot of people suspect foul play. I'm going to do what I usually do on my channel, which is give you guys the facts, we'll go over the theories, and then you can decide for yourself. I need to thank my subscribers. Thank you guys so much for your support and your kind words. I appreciate it so very much. And if you are new here, hi. This is me, I wear a tinfoil hat and I talk about true crime and conspiracies. So the whole thing starts on January 10th, 2013, when 17 year old Kendrick Johnson never came home from school. He was supposed to come home late that day because he did have a basketball game and then usually after the game he would hang out with friends. So at first his mother wasn't concerned. But then when midnight rolled around, she began to panic. So she decided to call 911 and report Kendrick missing. Here are the 911 dispatcher's notes. I want you to focus on just like one part over here where it says that his mother said he does not have a cell phone because later on when he's found, he has a cell phone on him. The next morning rolls around and Kendrick still doesn't come home. Now his mom is really freaked out. Now keep in mind that Kendrick's mom, she drives the school bus for the local school system and he usually rides with her to school. So she drives to his high school and she's talking to all the teachers and letting them know, hey, Kendrick didn't come home. At the same time, the officer that is responding to this missing persons case that she filed midnight shows up at the school to ask around. And that's when it turns from a missing persons case to something much worse. At the same time that this officer and Kendrick's mom are asking around trying to figure out where Kendrick is, on a totally different side of the school, known as the old gym, Kendrick's lifeless body is currently being discovered. So the people who find his body rolled up in a gym mat, 
they don't know that there's an officer there and that there's a missing persons case or any of that. So they call 911. In the Lowndes High School now, there's a dead body out here. Okay, where at, sir? Lowndes High School in the old gym. There's another set of officers that responded to the scene. These officers were the ones who questioned everyone and found out exactly what happened, how the body was discovered, and what happened in the moments after. January 11, 2013, Detective Whitener arrived at the Lowndes High School in reference to a death. Detective Whitener was directed to the old gym of the school where he met with the school resource officers. They allowed Detective Whitener to approach the area where the body was discovered. Detective Whitener did not approach the body as it was within a blue mat. Detective Whitener was advised that several students were present when the body was discovered as well as coach Philip Pipelow of the school and was directed to an office so that an interview could be conducted. Detectives Whitner and Pritchett of the Lowndes County Sheriff's Office met with Philip Pipelow within an athletic office. When asked to describe his involvement in the incident, he stated that during his life sports class, he was called by blank and blank, and it looks like they're related. I think these are two sisters who are in the class. He stated that the girls had been on top of wrestling mats, which were stacked in the corner of the gym. He stated that he thinks they had motioned for other students within the class to come over to the mats because they believed they had found something. Pipelo stated that the students then began yelling to him to come over and that they thought that they had found someone in the mats. He stated that he climbed the mats. When he reached the top, he saw feet inside. He stated that he could not move the person, so he climbed down and began to pull away the mats from the outside, trying to get to the mat the person was in. He stated that students helped him clear the mats. He stated that he reached the mat and he reached for the top of the mat, pulled it from the top down to the floor when he noticed that the person was deceased. Mr. Pipelow became upset and was having a hard time speaking. He stated that he does not remember who called 911, but that he had all the children leave the gym area. He stated that the main children who would have information on discovering the body were being held within a classroom and would allow the detectives to speak with them. The detectives then met with Blank. She stated that while in the class, she and her sister were on top of the mats. The detective asked them why they were on top of the mats, and she said she was going to lie down. She stated that after being there for a few minutes, she noticed feet with socks on them in the mat. She stated that someone was playing a joke, that so she called for Blank to come and look. She stated that she then called for help. She stated that she did not have any other information at this time. Now, the things that happen next are what started the rumors of foul play, and it's gonna be several things that I'm gonna tell you. First of all, was a Facebook post. It says blank, maybe more than one person because it's pretty long, not sure, came to the sheriff's office to report some Facebook posts. Blank stated that on today's date, after the student had been found at Lowndes High School, a student named blank posted on Facebook something to the effect of, when you start messing, the goons' bodies start showing up. She stated that shortly after the post, he deactivated his account so the message was no longer visible. Blank stated that prior to this date, Blank had, and it says Blank and, made posts on Facebook that he was going to start killing them off one by one. She explained that Kendrick and several of his friends were part of a group who called themselves CVC, which stands for the Clyetteville Click. She stated that Blank had been feuding with people from CVC because one of CVC's members, Blank, was messing with Blank girlfriend named TT. Blank was asked if she went to the game on Thursday and she stated no. She stated that she seen or talked to Blank who said that he had seen Kendrick after school on Thursday. She was not sure if Kendrick was at the game, but she said she heard Blank was blank provided a written statement this is another report about what happened in response to this facebook post blank said he heard that someone was found dead at the high school today and that he was being blamed for it detective marion asked blank if he knew who was found deceased at the high school and blank said i guess kj that's why his sister came with them to try to get me detective marion then asked why he would be blamed for kj's death Blank said, I don't know. 
Detective Marion asked if Blank had posted anything on Facebook recently and that would make people think he had any problems with KJ, Kendrick Johnson. Blank said he had no problems with KJ and first stated he didn't have a Facebook page, then said he had not posted anything on Facebook in two to three days. While this whole drama was going on outside of school, the investigation was going on inside the school at the scene. And so the first thing I want to talk about is the surveillance footage or, or obtaining the surveillance footage for now. We'll talk about the actual footage and what it shows later because there seemed to be an issue obtaining the footage in the beginning. So I want to read you the report about that. Detective attempted to produce a copy of the surveillance, but due to some technical problems, he was not able to produce a copy of the surveillance video. Detective Pretty met with Scott Forth, who is the IT person for the Lowndes County Board of Education, Detective Pretty explained to Scott that he wanted the last 48 hours of the surveillance for the entire wing of the school with the old gym. Scott advised the detective it would take a few days because there's close to 40 cameras on that wing. So then three days later, there's another part that's entered into the incident report and it talks about them actually finally getting the footage. Detective Pretty obtained a copy of the surveillance video from the old gym to include the cameras inside the gym, the cameras in the hallway of the gym, and the exterior entrance to the gym. The copy of the surveillance video was placed into property evidence. So at this point, let's talk about what happened at the scene, which at the time was determined to be a crime scene. So usually the protocol is once you determine the body is deceased, which they all did, you're supposed to call the coroner right away. That didn't happen here. As a matter of fact, the coroner wasn't called for over six hours and he was not happy about it. He spoke to media about this and this is what he said. I didn't know what to think. According to Georgia law, coroner Bill Watson should have been contacted immediately. This was not fair to the decedent, his family, and the citizens of Valdosta and Lowndes County, Georgia. And it's as wrong as rain. You may not want me on your crime scene, but it's a law. It's not something you can change your mind about. So already we have talks of two things, foul play and a cover up. You've got this person who potentially did something, and then you've got the, the first inkling of something weird happening you know the surveillance footage is kind of hard to obtain and then the coroner isn't called for six hours so already you know rumors are swirling and they're only going to get worse because things keep getting weirder so in addition to the coroner not being called for over six hours and then him speaking about it saying that this was incorrect there were two coroner's reports and we don't really know why we just know that the first report is the one that mentions how he wasn't called to the scene for over six hours. And then the second report talks about how law enforcement was not cooperative with him. So the coroner claimed the scene where Kendrick's body was found, quote, had been compromised and that there was no cooperation from law enforcement on the scene. Weird. I, I don't understand. I thought they kind of worked together. So already people are like, what is going on? And if you thought things were strange, they only get stranger. So what happened was there is an inconsistency with a report from the EMTs who responded to on the scene because they said that they saw bruising on Kendrick's jaw. But then the crime scene investigators like CSI, their crime lab report states that there are no injuries except for superficial things on the hand, but no bruising on the jaw is mentioned. Now, this is going to be a major part that's going to play in later on because of who, what organization or entity was responsible for the crime lab report, and that is GBI. GBI is the Georgia Bureau of Investigations, which is basically the local branch of the FBI. So you have, you know, the FBI, the main one in Quantico, and then you've got these local branches such as the GBI. This is gonna play in later, but I just wanna mention that for now. Let's talk about that crime lab report, okay? Because there's a lot of information there. It talks about crucial pieces of evidence and we need to go over that. The first thing we need to talk about are the items that were found on scene and what items were considered evidence and what items were left and not collected as evidence because that is also a controversial part of this case. This is the official 
paper from the crime lab. It says Valdosta Lounge Regional Crime Laboratory. I observed one black and white Adidas shoe on the floor in front of a rolled up mat lying horizontally in the southwest corner of the old gym. I observed one yellow two pocket folder on the gym floor in front of a rolled up mat near the west wall of the old gym. I observed one blue color physical science book on the floor behind two rolled up mats near the southwest wall entry exit door. This is important. I observed one gray Hollister pullover hooded sweater on the concrete floor around multiple horizontal and vertical rolled up mats in the southwest corner of the old gym. I noted a rolled up mat containing Johnson's deceased body lying in the horizontal position on the concrete floor in the southwest corner of the old gym. There were what appeared to be blood stains on the south wall of the old gym. A blood presumptive test was performed on the stains by GBI crime scene specialist Horn, which according to the manufacturer's instructions, the stains were positive for blood. It was noted that a pair of black, gray, and orange in color Nike shoes were observed near the bleachers on the north wall of the old gym. It appeared that the shoes had stains that looked similar to blood. A blood presumptive test was performed on the stains by GBI crime scene specialist Horn, which according to the manufacturer's instructions, the stains were negative for blood. During the removal of Johnson's body from the rolled up mat, additional items were observed that appear to have evidentiary value. One black and white Adidas shoe was located in the southwest area of the old gym on the concrete floor near Johnson's head in the pool of blood. The Adidas shoe was a US size 9.5, which appeared to be similar to crime scene item one. So remember how I mentioned that Kendrick's mom said he didn't own a cell phone? Well, this is the part where they find a cell phone on him. Johnson's pockets were searched in which one LG phone was, sorry, LG cell phone was located from his left front blue jeans pocket. Okay, so let's talk about the phone a little bit because when you go back to the incident report, which is separate from the crime lab report, they mention the phone and taking of the phone and sending it off and everything like that. What's interesting here is that they do discuss taking it and obtaining warrants to search it and then sending it to the GBI, which is remember the Georgia Bureau of Investigation to do a forensics on it, but we never, we'll ever find out what came out from that. I mean, maybe we'll find out now that the case is opened again, but at least I couldn't find, maybe, maybe it's there and I just didn't find it, but it's like, we could not find any information about who he contacted, what was on the phone, what wasn't on the phone, none of that. And the last thing that I was able to find in this incident report about the phone, it says Winningham sent the subpoenas to Ymax Communications Company for the phone number listed on the cell phone discovered in the deceased pocket. So I don't know if this is a number that he had called or had called him right before he was missing or I, I don't know. Okay, now this is a huge point over here that everybody focuses on. His shoulder span is 19 inches. And the opening, according to the crime line report, is a little over 14 inches, less than 15 inches. This is something that people who talk about foul play bring up a lot, which is if his shoulder span was 19 inches and the opening was less than 15 inches, how did he get in there, right? That's a discrepancy of four inches. So could he have, was there enough stretch room, you know, on either side or was it physically impossible? You know, you had tons of people doing demonstrations of like diving in there and how, you know, it, it for some people, a lot of people, it didn't seem plausible, but you know, you decide for yourself. Let's talk a little bit more about the shoes. There were actually three shoes, three pairs of shoes that were found on the scene, but only two pairs were collected as evidence. And this is another part that people talk about because they were like, why weren't all the shoes collected? So the two shoes that were collected were the Nikes that were size nine and they were uh, gray and white. And then there were the Adidas that were size nine and a half, which were black and white. Then we have the orange shoes that were, had the spatter on them that looked like blood, but that they tested on site and it wasn't presumptive for blood. Remember that? Those were not collected. 
And a lot of people are like, why wouldn't you collect them? They even had an expert on one of the news networks. I don't understand why. Former FBI Special Agent Harold Copet. Would this have been something you would have left? No, bag and tag. So I want to read you a little part from when Kendrick was missing when his mom described what he was last seen wearing. Ms. Johnson stated that the last time she saw Kendrick was at approximately 6.30 hours and he had on white and orange shirt with gray jeans and gray and white tennis shoes. These are the ones that were in the mat with Kendrick and these are the ones that his mother said he was last seen wearing. Then you have the black and white shoes that were found near the body. These are the ones that he's also seen wearing in his basketball picture and they are clearly basketball shoes. These are how basketball shoes look, okay? Then you've got these shoes. These are the mystery shoes, the ones that weren't taken, that had the spatter on them and this is a source of controversy, these shoes, right? There was another item that was witnessed and written about in the crime lab report that wasn't taken, and that is the gray Hollister sweater. Now, people look at this picture of the sweater and they say that they see blood on the sleeve and they also can't believe why it wasn't taken. This hooded sweatshirt found a few feet from Kendrick's body. And if you look real close, there's something on this particular cuff. And then the question is, was it blood? Did you test it? Why are two items that appear to have blood spatter on them not taken as evidence? Why? Weird, right? So here's the next weird thing that happened. A bunch of students had asked the school to hold a vigil for Kendrick and the school refused. So it says Lowndes High will not host vigil Thursday night. This was published by the Valdosta Daily Times January 15, 2013. It says Lowndes County School officials said today that a vigil will not be held at Lowndes High School Thursday evening as, provo as proposed by a student in today's editions of the Valdosta Daily Times. There will be no vigil Thursday evening on the school's campus for Kendrick Johnson, the sophomore found dead in the old gym last Friday, according to the Lowndes County school system. However, family members of the late Kendrick Johnson will be holding a community-wide vigil at 6 p.m. Wednesdays at Saunders Park. Regardless of whether it's foul play or an accident, you know, the school is probably afraid of the liability, right? Like this happened on your watch. So in the interest of self-preservation, you would think they'd say, of course we want to host it for, you know, Ken, you know, our student and he died on campus. I don't know, weird. So of course, when the news came out that the coroner wasn't, um, called in for six hours and the school did not want to host the vigil. People start talking about cover up, cover up because there was already talk about foul play. The day it was, the body was discovered, there was talk about foul play because of the Facebook post and everything like that. So now people were saying, okay, somebody did this to him and is the school protecting them? Why is the school, you know, acting this way, right? And so already we had issues with the, the community and the school and Kendrick's family and the school, keep in mind, his mother worked for the school system. So it's like really weird that they're not hosting a vigil. I mean, it's not only a student, but it's the son of one of their employees. I mean, the whole thing is weird. It happened there. I mean, it's strange. Now, <clears throat> as if things weren't odd enough, the same day that it was announced that the school was not going to host a vigil for Kendrick, the sheriff came out and said that there was no foul play and that this was an accident. Now keep in mind, the autopsy has not been completed or released, but he came out and he made a statement and this is what the sheriff's office statement said. At some point, Kendrick Johnson either reached into the center of one of the rolled mats or fell into the center opening of the mat and became lodged. We feel like he was trying to reach a shoe that was down that hole, but no one knows why, why he reached into the mat, but him and the good Lord. They say that the student was upside down in the mat with blood rushing to his head and upper extremities, causing him to pass out. Keeping a human body upside down for an extended period of time can be deadly, causing hemorrhaging, stroke, and heart failure. So now here's the interesting part. According to the sheriff's own incident report. This statement was released two days before they had interviews with students 
who mentioned this common practice of students, including Kendrick, they'd witnessed Kendrick and other students who could not afford lockers using the gym mat area as lockers in the sense that this is what they would do. They had their like nice shoes, right? And they, they would have their shoes like the basketball shoes that they would wear when they were playing sports. And so they would throw their good shoes in the area where the mats were and then they would wear their athletic shoes, play sports, and then come back and switch them out. And sometimes they would even, you know, switch shoes with each other, but that everyone threw the shoes that way. So this was on January 17th, so two days after the announcement. It says Jack Winningham and Sergeant Mike Adams spoke with Blank at Lowndes High School in regards to he and Kendrick sharing shoes and hiding them in the wrestling mats in the old gym. Blank informed Adams and Winningham that Johnson's shoes were black and white Adidas and they both would put them in the mats in the old gym. Winningham asked Blank to describe the shoes and he said they were black and white Adidas. Winningham showed Blank one of the shoes found in the gym by the mats and Blank advised Winningham the shoes were Johnson's or the shoe was Johnson's. Winningham notes that also that Blank also informed him that Johnson also had a pair of orange and white Griffins. Provided a, Blank provided a written statement. On the same date, Sergeant Adams interviewed Blank Blank is one of Johnson's friends and would put his shoes inside the mats as well, according to his statement. And now this is another student who says Blank stated he was in the 10th grade. Blank stated he had third block gym last semester with Kendrick Johnson. Blank stated he observed Kendrick Johnson and other students, quote, throwing shoes over the mats in the corner and then go retrieve them the next day to play basketball. Blank stated this was common and that other students did this as well. Detective Marion asked Blank if he would provide a written statement and when completed to give it to Sergeant Mike Adams at the school, this concluded the interview with Blank. When this was announced, right, that this was an accident, that they had this practice throwing the shoes and that it was just this freak, tragic accident that happened where, you know, nobody was around and he went to reach in and he had suffocated and nobody heard him. And then, you know, he was just in there all night and then up until the next morning until they found him, people had a hard time believing that, a very hard time and you started to see division starting in the community. The people who believed this was an accident and the people who thought, no, 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 this is foul play, this is a cover-up, it's a conspiracy. In addition to all the strange things that I told you, there's more stuff that people started pointing to when they said that this was foul play followed by a cover-up. The first thing they talked about was the blood on the walls. Remember, well, turns out the blood was not Kendrick Johnson's, however, they didn't test anyone else to see if it belonged to them. And when the media asked them why... And we tested it and it was blood. Now we did DNA testing and it was not the blood of Kendrick Johnson. If it wasn't Kendrick's blood, who blood was it? Did you ever find out who it was or any involved? No, as, as, of, as of now we haven't, no. That's potential evidence. Obviously, we're going to check this out and find out who does it belong to. This is an athletic gym. I mean, obviously, this is where they conduct uh, various athletic classes. A kid couldn't have scraped their knee or arm or something and got that much blood on the wall. There's one, two, three, four, five, six. Six impacts. I think this young man met with foul play. I think Jones, but I could be wrong. But one of the members of law enforcement said that there are basically 3,000 students and there's just no way to test all of them, so they didn't test any of them. And so people were like, okay, kind of cover up -y. Why aren't you trying to figure out whose blood this is? If it's not Kendrick's, maybe it's somebody who had an altercation with Kendrick and this would prove that they were there and that they had the blood. Instead, they said, it's not Kendrick's, we didn't test anybody's, and in fact, this blood has been here for a very long time. It probably has absolutely nothing to do with this situation. Now, people had issues with that as well because they're saying, no, there's a cleaning crew that comes in and those streaks were very noticeable. There's no way with, that they would have been left there for that long. Those must have happened very recently. So of course, there's no way to prove either way. That's gonna be up to you guys to determine where you stand on that. Here's where we start to have potential suspects, okay? Because, right, people are saying foul play. So 
okay, who, who did it? Is it the kid who did the Facebook post? We don't know who that person is. The name's been redacted. What we do know is that Kendrick had a fight with a student before, and that student was caught on surveillance as being in the area. Now that's a whole thing, we'll talk about the surveillance, but that student was there, as was his brother, and supposedly they had a fight um, before, and this is what the fight was about and all the details regarding that. So let's start with the father and what he said. They start saying mama jokes, and my son got the best of him with the jokes, and he came at him and tried to put him in a headlock. And my son got away from him and he came and he put it to him real good. My son was the first one to whoop him, said Mr. Johnson. He whooped him. My son stood his ground and stopped him. But this guy here is a bully. So after the two were separated, the elder student was turned over to his parents while Kendrick was forced to ride home in a police cruiser. They were already separated because the other kid went with his parents. So why couldn't Kendrick ride in the back of the bus? According to Kendrick's family, the teenager decided to quit the team after the incident. Now let's talk about how the boy, which he'll later be identified, so maybe I should just say it because they identified themselves. They became known as the Bell Brothers and their father is Rick Bell, who is an FBI agent, which factors a lot in this case when they talk about cover-ups and connections and all that kind of stuff. So I'm gonna be referring to them as the Bell Brothers. You've got Brian Bell and Brandon Bell. And Brian is the one that seems to have had this fight with Kendrick. So let's go to their version of events. It's all started with a fight on a school bus more than a year before Johnson's death. So they are very much pointing out that this was a year ago and it wasn't this like recent thing, right? So that's something they want to note. It says, according to Brian Bell, then a freshman, the scuffle on the bus with teammate KJ was over something minor, forgotten the next week. So remember how Kendrick's father said that, you know, his son had to go home in a police cruiser whereas they were free to go with their parents and he didn't understand why Kendrick couldn't just go in the bus. Well, this is what the Bell brothers' mother said, quote, we drove our son back home after the game, but Kendrick rode in the front seat of a resource officer's car because he didn't have family at the game. If I had known that he was going to ha that that was going to happen before we left, I would have seen if he could ride home with us. Kendrick had been over to our house several times and a few times after that. They were friends. So some people said, well, oh, they were friends. So maybe there was more of a issue between them. And that even though this fight happened a year ago, if they were friends, maybe there were still things that were happening up until the moment he died. When a reporter approached Lowndes High School Vikings football coach Randy McPherson about the initial scuffle, which was apparently caught on a video recording, he referred comments to the Board of Education. Quote, who told you about a scuffle? He said outside his home in the gated community a few miles from the high school. You're going to have to talk to the superintendent. The Lowndes County Board of Education refer refused to discuss anything regarding Kendrick's case. When this came out and the police heard about it, they went to go talk to the boys, but their father, the FBI agent, he wouldn't allow them to talk to them and he got them an attorney and he advised the investigators to speak to the attorney and the attorney also refused to speak to them. So there is mention of this in the incident report. This happened on January 17, so six days after Kendrick's body was found. It says that the sergeants were interviewing students when it was brought to their attention that Johnson had been in an altercation on a school bus during a football game. Winningham requested Sergeant Mike Adams call blank, the father of blank, and request an interview. Winningham notes that Adams called blank and he referred him to his attorney. They relayed this information to Sergeant, I mean, sorry, Lieutenant Jones, and he spoke with blank. Winningham notes that Bell referred Jones to his attorney, Jason Ferguson. Blank was not interviewed. That's the information that we have about this fight, but this was more than enough for the people who felt like this was foul play to suspect that Brian and Brandon Bell had something to do with this. And later on, we're gonna have more confessions and more things that make people really think that they are somehow involved, allegedly, my conspiracy don't sue me. When word got out that there was this fight between Kendrick and Brian Bell and that you know, his father was an FBI agent and that the local GBI was handling the case, 
if you thought they were rumors about a cover-up then, well, they had reached fever pitch at this point. People were convinced that all these weird things that were happening that didn't make sense all trace back to the father sort of covering up for his sons that something happened that night that they called their dad and the dad and the school and everybody kind of got together they did something with the footage they did you know they weren't calling the coroner you they weren't taking pieces of evidence you know all this stuff kind of these rumors were swirling and then you had this major racial element Ain't gonna let the TV out. it's the south it's Georgia and then you've got a black guy who is dead and then you've got the white sons I don't know why I'm doing this like it's allegedly they're white white sons of an FBI agent that you know murdered him allegedly my conspiracy don't sue me and that you know this cover-up and that you know they don't care if it was a white kid this wouldn't have happened and this happened because he's black and frame it in the black lives matter movement and the town was divided you had, you know, the family of Kendrick that were outside, you know, standing, protesting with signs, you know, saying justice for Kendrick. And then you had people who believed it was an accident that were screaming things like, get over it. And, and you know, it's an accident. Da -da -da -da. It was just so much tension in the community. And then the autopsy was released. And it wasn't released willingly. The local news station or paper, they actually had to do what's known as an open records request to get the autopsy. And when they got the autopsy, n nobody was happy. So let me clarify something because I didn't know this. So maybe somebody else doesn't know, or maybe you guys know, and I'm an idiot. I don't know. But the coroner does not perform the autopsy. Remember the coroner that was pissed that he wasn't, you know, called right away. He doesn't do that. It's the medical examiner who does it. And uh, this medical examiner and the autopsy was conducted by the Georgia Bureau of Investigations, which is the local branch of the FBI. People who already felt like the GBI was covering up due to, you know, the potential alleged suspects being the son of an FBI agent, they already were kind of dismissing the autopsy by saying, you know, conflict of interest, no, whatever, like, we're not going to believe it. Well, the autopsy was released and it confirmed the theory that the sheriff had come out with initially, which was that it was an accident and the cause of death was positional asphyxia. There are a few things that I want to mention and note that were in the autopsy because these are things that people talked about and, you know, fueled the rumors and the conspiracy theories, the fingernails, because in the autopsy, it says, if you look at the last line, it says fingernails intact, trimmed and worn short, no obvious foreign body material present. When people saw this, this is what they said. And this was largely like speculated online. Somebody who was trying to cover it up, you know, those six hours that went by where they didn't call the coroner. Well, they, they trimmed his nails because you know how like when there's defensive wounds or like a scuffle, uh, usually the victim will have DNA under their nail of the person who was attacking them. The theory here is that they knew that those things could identify the potential suspect and to cover for the suspect, they clipped his nails. So you decide if that's plausible or not. We need to talk about organs, okay? Yeah, this is crucial because later on, we're gonna find out that the organs were, are missing, okay? So let's look at what it says here about the organs. All body organs are present and in their normal anatomical positions. So the family was already saying we're, we want an independent autopsy. They were able to exhume Kendrick's body to perform a second autopsy. And it was during this autopsy where they discovered that Kendrick's organs were missing. The heart, lungs, liver, etc., were not with the body. Brain, they were all absent. Every organ from the top of Kendrick's head to his pelvis, gone. What was in the place of the organs? newspaper the only two parties that had custody of kendrick's body after he was found you know at the gym were the gbi and the funeral home and both of them were placing the blame on each other 
the GBI said when we released the body, the organs were in there. The funeral home said when we got the body, the organs weren't there. So of course, people were saying, why are the organs removed? Are they removed because maybe they show evidence of maybe like foul play? Now let's talk about the findings other than the fact that the organs were missing because this autopsy directly contradicts the first one. It says that the cause of death was actually blunt force trauma, that there was bruising. Remember that original bruising that the EMTs mentioned? Yeah, they said that there's bruising, hemorrhaging, that the, the something hit the Kendrick's jaw and, and broke his neck essentially and that this is what caused his death. And that it was, let me read it to you exactly before I start saying whatever. It says, cause of death, blunt force trauma, right neck involving right mandible and soft tissues, including the area of the cartoid body consistent with inflicted injury. Note, unexplained apparent non-accidental blunt force trauma. Further investigation is indicated to determine the etiology of the injuries. And so now the mystery deepens. So what's, what's going on, right? In order to answer this question, all sides were looking to the surveillance footage. So let's talk about the footage because as we know, there was a bit of an issue exporting the footage, but then there were more issues. You had time discrepancies. Several students are seen walking into and out of the old gym and three of them walk into the gym within three minutes prior to Kendrick Johnson walking in. There are multiple gaps in the video surveillance in the gym. There are four cameras in the gym that records motion from when the lights turn on in the morning until when the lights are turned off at night except for the area of interest. I would absolutely expect there to be some record of that activity and we don't have any here. When surveillance in the gym resumes at 109, we see just these few frames of Kendrick Johnson running in the gym. It is the last time his image is captured on video. There was just one camera that was pointed in the area of the mats and that camera was blurry. People were like, oh, it's blurry. Oh, how convenient. It's blurry, like really? But then they had this expert come in and he said that something could have knocked it out and made it blurry. And when they asked the school, why was this blurry? The school said that a basketball had hit the lens and knocked it out of focus. And the last footage you see of Kendrick is him being wheeled out in a body bag. But the last time you see him alive, he's running. So you've got people saying like, what is he running from? Essentially what it boils down to is there's no straight answer for sure, depending on what you want to believe so when everyone was looking to the surveillance footage for answers they didn't really find any we're back at square one where the community is divided and the family believes something happened and the official story is that it was an accident so because the case was so controversial the united states department of justice stepped in and decided that they were going to conduct their own investigation meanwhile confessions and tips started coming in and each tip and confession would eventually be discredited by the investigators. This email was Monday, January 27, 2014, anonymous tip. My best friend was at a party Saturday night with Redacted and Redacted was upset about something that Redacted had said to her. So her and my best friend started talking and by the end of the night, blank i'm gonna say because it rolls off the tongue easier had told my friend everything that the whole nation has been wondering for the past year she told my friend what really happened to kendrick johnson blank said that about a little over a year ago she had sexual intercourse with kendrick johnson while she was dating blank blank found out and threatened kj kj told blank to meet him in the old gym after third block and he would have his knife ready and then there's a huge part that's redacted. And then met KJ and killed him. Sorry, I'm having trouble hearing you. I, I wasn't talking to you. Spying on me. Met KJ and killed him. Blank has also been heard admitting to killing KJ more than once over the phone. His brother, Blank, also got drunk at a party on the 4th of July and told many people that Blank killed KJ and that he, Blank, was tired of keeping it a secret. A lot of people think that these are the Bell Brothers that they're talking about. I'm going to read you from an article that's dated March 21st, 2014. So a few months after this tip came in, this article was published. 
quote, we identified the email source as a juvenile who attends Lance High School. Everything the kids heard was a rumor and speculation on the part of other people. We found no credible information to support the statements made in the email. Now let's talk about another tip, confession, whatever you want to call it. From Dalton Ray Chauncey, and he ends up getting arrested for lying when it comes to this. Dalton Chauncey came into the sheriff's office and relayed that he had been present during a conversation in which two individuals made admissions that caused that they caused the death of Kendrick Johnson in January 2013. He said he only knew the first name of the individuals and that a third person whom he did know was present and heard these admissions. So investigators apparently immediately began conducting interviews and they said that the person who Chauncey said was there denied ever being there or ever hearing any of this. And then they said that they met with him again and they pressured him and that's when he told them he was lying. He just was boasting. Chauncey's mother actually came out and said that she doesn't believe her son was lying, that he was interviewed without her uh, by himself and he was pressured to say that he was lying. Michelle Chauncey alleged sheriff deputies, quote, kept coming and coming, end quote, at her son during questioning about his statement to two Lowndes High School seniors told him they killed Johnson over an issue about a girl. She described his admission as, quote, sarcastic. I'm upset. I believe my son. He didn't lie. He just made a statement of what he heard. If you're going at him constantly, he's going to tell you what you want to hear. Despite what the mother said, he ends up getting charged and he serves a little bit of time. But I want to fast forward to three years after these two confessions and tips come in because then we have another. So it says here, my name is Ryan Anthony Domic Hernandez and I'm over the age of 21. I am giving this declaration voluntarily and I have personal knowledge of the facts stated herein and know them to be true. I met Brandon Bell in April 2016 and on one occasion was with him at his apartment in Jacksonville, Florida when he told me that his younger brother killed Kendrick Johnson. According to Brandon Bell, Brian Bell, Ryan Hall, and Kendrick Johnson were in the gym when an argument between Brian and Kendrick began. The argument was about or over Brian's girlfriend. According to Brandon Bell, Brian was taking steroids at the time and out of quote, roid rage, or the effects of the steroids, he struck Kendrick Johnson in the neck with a 45 pound weight or dumbbell. Brandon Bell stated that Brian Bell opined that the aforementioned blow may have broken Kendrick Johnson's neck. According to Brandon Bell, Ryan Hall was a witness to the fight and Brian Bell told Ryan Hall that if he didn't keep quiet and help him move Kendrick Johnson's body, his father, now retired FBI Special Agent Rick Bell, would make sure Ryan Hall would, quote, pay for it. Brandon Bell also told me that his father got in touch with Sheriff Chris Prine after being notified of the fight and Kendrick Johnson's death. Brandon Bell also told me that Sheriff Chris Prine got in touch with the county coroner. Brandon Bell also told me that his father got in touch with another FBI agent who in some way facilitated the editing of the high school surveillance video by corrupting or deleting some one hour and 25 minutes of the original recording. Brandon Bell also told me that after Kendrick Johnson's death, that his organs were removed and newspapers placed in the cavity so as to interfere with any effort to establish the correct time of death or to otherwise disclose any other injuries. Brandon Bell also told me that the autopsy was falsely documented. I'm giving this declaration in support of plaintiff's motion to withdraw admissions and plaintiff's op opposition to defendant's motions for attorney's fees and expenses pursuant to blah, blah, blah. And then it says executed on the 6th day of August, 2017, signed Ryan Anthony Domic Hernandez. This witness, Ryan, he got arrested right after this affidavit for trespassing and supposedly the the charges or the punishment for it was not the normal punishment and Kendrick's mom posted on Facebook what she believed to be a cover-up. Is this witness tampering once again on behalf of the Kendrick Johnson case? Boy, when I tell you Lowndes County is full of S-T, we had a witness come forward in Kendrick Johnson case and now all of a sudden he's in Lowndes County Jail 
for allegedly trespassing. Boy, these folks are something else. But no news covered that, but covered what the Judge Porter said about 300K was all over the news. Because as part of the lawsuits, a lot, pretty much all of the family, Kendrick's family's lawsuits were dismissed. And at this time, when the last one was dismissed, they were ordered to pay $300,000 in attorney's fees. So that's what she's referencing here. Um, it says, this is the second person that told what happened to KJ. They took them to jail for bogus charges and then recanted their own story. The little news lady texts my phone for the 300K about Judge Porter, but never texts about the witness that came forward. They want to hush him up and allegedly cover this up. I filed these charges August 7th, 2017 at 10.06 a.m. That's when Porter just threw his ruling in never getting back to our attorney or nothing, anything to allegedly stop the truth from coming out about KJ. They are trying to silence him. Please share this post with all the news site, radio show, CNN, New, News 1, Channel 6, 1027, Steve Harvey, Ricky Smiley, and anyone you can think of. Valdosta needs to be put on the news for all of this. Tweet Instagram. And this is what people were saying was odd. Um, it says here, surprisingly, his criminal trespass charges are listed as not eligible for bail. That is unusual because criminal trespass is considered a misdemeanor in most cases and a bail should be posted. So remember how I said that there was a lot of issues with the surveillance footage and, you know, like timestamps and vanishing students and weird things. So they ended up sending this footage to the FBI, like not GBI, but like the FBI, FBI in Quantico in Virginia to be analyzed, to determine, you know, what happened and whether these suspects who were being brought up, the Bell brothers, if they were somehow involved. And so the FBI came back and they said that they determined that the persons of interest, which was Brandon and Brian Bell, were not near Kendrick at the time of his death. And they said that they determined this through the surveillance footage. Remember, there's a separate investigation going on by the Department of Justice that I mentioned earlier. Well, as part of that investigation, a bunch of US Marshals showed up at the Bell's home to execute a search warrant. Video identified as a raid on the home of FBI agent Rick Bell. You can see the scuff marks from the shoes as uh, the U.S. Marshals knocked. Tactical gear? Yes, sir, to the nth degree. I was laying in bed, I got a bang on my door. They were just like, it's about the Kendra Johnson case. The ongoing Kendra Johnson investigation. I broke down and cried. Bell says what he and brother Brian Bell woke up to was worse than a bad dream. One might imagine Kendrick Johnson's mom feels like she's in a nightmare that won't end. Did you have anything to do with the death of Kendrick Johnson? No, sir. I'm gonna ask my photographer to push in tight on your face. Okay. Our viewers can read your expression. Did you have anything to do with the death of Kendrick Johnson? No. Did you see Kendrick that day? No. I did not. Where were you? I was in class. We talked to Brandon Bell about his appearance. I was uh, changing clothes before I had to leave for the uh, wrestling tournament. So much in here is unusual to say the least. Soon after this search warrant was served, an open letter was published from a group of FBI agents to the head of the Department of Justice, basically telling them to close the investigation. And a lot of people say that this shows just how much sway the Bell family has. It's dated August 11th, 2015, and it's addressed to Loretta Lynch, the Attorney General of the United States Department of Justice. So it says here, Dear General Lynch, on behalf of the Society of Former Special Agents of the FBI, I request that you urge United States Attorney Michael Moore of the Middle District of Georgia to complete his review of the circumstances surrounding the tragic death of Kendrick Johnson as soon as reasonably possible. The Society is an apolitical nonprofit member organization comprised of 8,500 former and active FBI agents, and it operates independently of the FBI. FBI Special Agent Richard Bell is an active FBI agent and a member of our organization. The Society has been monitoring, monitoring information in the public domain about this matter for over a year. The review of factual evidence 
to support what happened in a high school gym could and should have been completed by now. Mr. Moore's review began more than 21 months ago and it has taken a huge personal and professional toll on Special Agent Bell and his family. They have had to face many challenges as a direct result of Mr. Moore's review. Among them, Special Agent Bell and his sons were issued target letters, although it remains unclear if the federal standard for an underlying crime has ever been met. Last month, the Bells were subjected to early morning raids to execute search warrants for evidence of witness tampering and or obstruction. These raids were just the latest example of disproportionate handling of this matter. In addition, the Bells have been subjected to a steady stream of threats while a cloud of suspicion hangs over them. Absent a finding that Johnson's death was homicide, the continuing and relentless targeting of a dedicated FBI agent and his family sends a disturbing message to the law enforcement community. The delay in resulting, resolving this matter has resulted in undue polarization within the local community and between law enforcement agencies. Mr. Moore's actions raise the question of whether he can be effective in his leadership role. The society is not alone in asking that this criminal review be solved. Community leaders in Georgia have also weighed in to ask for a logical conclusion. Your attention to this request would be greatly appreciated. I would be happy to meet with you personally at any time to further discuss this matter. Sincerely, Ellen Glasser, National President, Society of Formal Special Agents of the FBI, CC Director of the FBI, James Comey. Are you prepared for more weird things? After that letter was published, Michael Moore abruptly resigns. He assigns it to another U.S. attorney. And then what do you think happens after that? That U.S. attorney resigns as well. And then a few months after the second attorney, uh, U.S. attorney resigns, that investigation is closed. They say after extensive investigation into this tragic event, federal investigators determined there's insufficient evidence to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that someone or some group of people willfully violated Kendrick Johnson's civil rights or committed any other prosecutable federal crime, the U.S. Justice Department said in a statement. Accordingly, the investigation into this incident has been closed without the filing of federal criminal charges. As you can imagine, the Bell family was happy and relieved and the Johnson family was sad and disappointed. And that was pretty much the end of it until earlier this month. The um, investigation has been opened because of an uh, audio tape with uh, supposedly a confession. We haven't heard the audio tape, but they do say something where somebody says, man, Kendrick didn't deserve that, that this person claims that they like killed Kendrick. And so now it's a, there's a new sheriff in town, literally. So the sheriff said he's going to determine whether that confession is credible. And he's also going to look at the case with fresh eyes. And that's where things stand right now. Uh, I would love to know what you guys think. Thank you so much for watching. Uh, please subscribe if you haven't already. And I will see you guys in the next one. Bye.